media gear you can accomplish anything you play any and every position coaching to kicking 
to receiving to running and juking. And, oh my goodness, I see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're gonna have a lot of haters coming at you, but what you gotta do is you gotta shake them off, shake them off, and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today. Yeah. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another pop-up edition of I Mix What I Like Live right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball, your host. Uh, Happy to squeeze in here real quick in between the remix and Jackie's 12 o'clock lunch power, lunch hour, super power hour, power lunch, whatever she's calling it. I'll jump in the chat uh, and be in the audience for that. But I've been working again all morning. All morning, uh, I've been spending on the latest edition uh, of the myth and propaganda of black buying power. The deadline is New Year's Eve. Uh, and despite all what I thought was was preparation. Ah, there we go. Despite all that I thought was was going on with preparation and everything, I'm always, you know, struggling to catch up and and get my my thoughts organized and together um so and i hope the audio just slightly improved sometimes the 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 mic settings get adjusted when when setting up here especially if i'm rushing as i am a little bit this morning so but everything should sound uh uh all good anyway so i just but but i had an update so i finished the robert smith earn your leisure piece wanted to to update that and also i found uh because i was literally working on the chapter uh updating chapter four uh which is the the uh, myth and purveyors of black buying power section um and uh, the chapter rather on the myth and per- the, the the modern purveyors of the myth, and I because I've had to add a little bit about uh, McKinsey and Company, uh, and who have become what I'm saying now are the third of what I'm calling the big three of Selig Center, Nielsen, and McKinsey in terms of the the popular sources and promoters of uh, buying power. Selig is still the dominant source. Uh, but but McKinsey has been increasingly popping in. So as I talked about in, in part one of this, I mentioned that I mentioned uh, this article, which I'll pull up here by Michael Cord, uh, who was uh, uh, misrep- you know, one of the the the, you know, newer misrepresenters of uh, or, or I was let me let me slow down. Let me slow down. I was in part one showing you this article from Michael Cord, which is one of the more recent, although I had referenced him earlier because he's he's a repeat offender with this. But uh, uh, just updating the references in the press to black buying power. And he came up again. But specifically, I noted that is which is largely the case with his. um misrepresenting the the facts here that here where he writes where he talks about the 300 was that the first reference to it the 300 billion dollars that we have to spend he reduces buying power by misreading the data uh to 300 billion uh so here we here is where we were with that what happened i didn't i didn't have all this highlighted initially all right well there we go there it is um so again as i was saying he cites a forbes story but but my point is um wow i should wow now i'm just seeing i probably should go and do that or i should have gone and done that just to clarify but but um 
You know what? Let me see if I could do this real quick. My bad, everybody. I should have done this and checked this already. Because what I was saying was, is that in 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 citing this story, he was th that Forbes, I was arguing, was likely referencing a recently that is around this time, 2021, published story from uh, McKinsey. Now, I think, though, that the McKinsey story that. Yeah, 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 exactly, because. So without being able to look it up, so I'll just do it this way. I had said in part one that this Forbes reference that Cord is making is itself referencing a recently, from that point, 2021, published report from McKinsey. And that Cord was either misreading, misrepresenting the Forbes story and or misreading and misreporting McKinsey's report. And all to the to his point of claiming that black people spend three hundred billion dollars a year, but we do it ignorantly and foolishly without financial literacy. We get nothing back in return that we're suffering from post-traumatic slave syndrome. And therefore, we don't know what to do with our money again, because it has nothing to do. Again, this is important. Not that Joy Degree is entirely wrong or her argument is without merit. But the point would be also here that that the goal is to not talk about class, to not talk about capitalism, to not talk about the economy per se as it works or political economy, uh, but to talk about just how black people ignorantly because of of, of, a, of a PTSD, a post-traumatic slave syndrome, uh, we're, we don't know what to do with our money. And I noted that his reference to these don't buy where you can't work slogans was something that Abram Harris had debunked at the time as a, as a flaw and something that I was saying updated in terms of buying black and banking black does not help. Um, all right. So what I should have done is just to confirm that that story is in fact what he was misrepresenting. Uh, but so maybe I'll just do, I'll come back to that another time. But what I will do right now is just show that what I think he was misrepresenting because that he was, that was a February, a Forbes story from September of 2021. But in August of 2021, and as I covered on this program, uh, when it came out, uh, McKinsey had published this story, a $300 billion opportunity serving the emerging black American consumer. All right. Now, Cord, again, as many reporters do when it comes to this, they're misrepresenting, they're, they're misreading data that is itself misrepresenting the economy. And in, in, in the updated chapter four, I talk about a little bit about McKinsey's history. I demonstrate how they, uh, um, how they're situated as corporate consultants who use political power to help corporations that hire them get the public policy and the exploitive uh, capability of that company risen to its highest capability. They help companies, they're consultants that help companies exploit labor, and they've been doing it for over 100 years with great success, helping companies, intelligence agencies, uh, 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 the government itself, uh, make as much money as possible off of labor. So they're not here to help black people understand the economy or their relationship to the economy. But what they're saying in this report, as the headline suggests, which I doubt Cord and many others have actually read, is that the, the point is that if you are a corporation who seeks to serve this untapped black market, you can increase your, there is 300 billion more out there for you. Now, how do they get there? And again, I talk about this. I just updated the chapter. I just finished it. I don't know, 10 minutes ago. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it, you know, or we'll come back to that another time to talk, you know, when, when in the spring, when the book comes out, obviously, or when you all get a chance to read and critique and whatever, we could talk more about it. But essentially what I was talking about is just showing is that McKinsey is itself doing what Selig and Nielsen have been doing that, which is again, just helping ad revenue get targeted. Um, and they've rebranded it under the guise of their own Institute for the black, uh, black economic Institute or whatever they're calling it 
um, as a way to rebrand themselves as consultants to help marketers and companies address themselves to the diverse society and to to attract whatever is being spent by black people. All right. So as they say here, um, black households do have a lower income and wealth, despite the 13, four, wait, I'm just going in order here. Uh, well, anyway, let me just back up. There's a big market to be unearthed if companies meet the real needs of black consumers. So again, this is not targeting black people so that black people understand their condition. This is targeting marketers and companies who want to reach black consumers. And they're just simply saying there's a $300 billion opportunity to them. Now, what Michael Cord would probably want to argue is that if if we spent this money with black businesses, we would be helping black businesses. But part of what he and many others, again, leave out of the equation is that you have to be in position to serve those consumers. That is, you have to have the capital investment to scale up. You have to have the the the. Um, I don't know the competitive placement in the in the in the marketplace to reach those consumers, to market to those consumers, to again scale up to 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 serve those consumers. Black people don't have that, and they don't have that in any of the in in most of the dominant industries where most of the money in this society is made. So again, this is meant to help large white companies and, and businesses reach black consumers. That is the point. Black households do have a lower income and wealth. Despite the 13.4% of the U.S. populations, black households accounted for just under 10% of the nation's total spending on goods and services in 2019. Because black workers bring home smaller paychecks, they have less money to work with every month, especially after accounting for debt. Nonetheless, companies that interpret this data as proof that there's little profit in serving black consumers are making a big mistake. So they're saying, look, black people don't have any money. Black people don't make any money. Black people don't spend more than they are per, per capita in the society. But, and we're not here to help black people improve that. We're here to help companies maximize profits off of that reality. So they say, we estimate that companies filling these needs could tap into $300 billion of value annually. So this is not saying that black spending power is only three, thir, 300 billion, which is what Michael Cord misread that to say. It's saying that this is an untapped leftover. Because as they say in their in result of their own surveys, beneath these sobering realities, however, is a market with substantial buying power and influence and plenty of upside for the future. In 2019, consumer expenditures by black households, households totaled approximately $835 billion. Combined spending by all black households has increased 5% annually over the past two decades. It has outpaced the growth rate of combined spending by white households, 3% driven by mostly faster population growth. So as I said, going back to the very beginning of this in the early 2000s, Buying power is a concocted hodgepodge of nonsense that incorporates all kinds of silly things from faster population growth to, as they said in one of the early reports, black people die sooner. So there are few black people who live to be old enough to be part of the elder, eldership society that spends less in the economy. Therefore, they because they live during during the peak years of spending, they have a higher and inflated buying power. And again, not accounting for the fact that black people due to lack of health care, stress, oppression, et cetera, die earlier. They they don't ref they they reframe that as a bonus. That is, this is the selling center initially, but that's what's being done here. Black people are poor. Black people don't have anything. But because black people are faster growing in population, that means there will be more of them to spend what little they have. And that's how we're saying there's a $300 billion. We're concluding in a $300 billion uh, uptick. So I just wanted to show that very quickly because, by the way, and I'll save this for later. I don't want to I want to get to the other part and I, and I want to make sure I'm out of here before Jackie goes. But but the. The that report itself, and this is what I just finished writing about in the updated chapter four, is 
criticized by McKinsey, uh, by another report, a newer report from McKinsey that came this year that said that report underestimates Black spending power because it doesn't include the spending of every Black person in the country. So as I wrote about in the book, in the first edition, it's still true. Their argument, McKinsey's doing the same thing and arguing that buying power for Black people goes up. Um, or I should say, <laughs> sorry, uh, just as I said in the first one, their argument is that buying power, McKinsey is updating what the Selig Center had been doing. I'm rushing. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm all over the place, but, but, but I'm still correct. McKinsey is doing what Selig had done and been doing for decades. And, and as I wrote in the first edition is doing again here saying that somehow black people have a power in their spending by saying that by, by counting every dollar that black people earn as if it were, and, and expecting it to be, be spent by every black person in the community. So if black people spend every dollar they earn, and in and in and in, case, in cases according to the BLS interview that I did, where they don't where the BLS does not count credit, these numbers apparently do count credit. They're even counting money that black people haven't earned as part of their spending power, but specifically only in their ability to enrich companies who would attract those consumers through targeted ad revenue, ad spending, which is what McKinsey, Nielsen, and Selig are helping them to do. Woo! Anyway. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Quick break and let's finish with Robert Smith. All right. Just wanted to wrap that up. I mix what I, I, mix, I like, I what, mix, I like I what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, All right, everybody. So finishing up with a uh, discussion of the Robert Smith interview on Earn Your Leisure, uh, there were a couple of other things that came up that I think are, are um, worth uh, bringing up here. Um, and so what I will do is just as I did the last time, pull up just so we have, although I do want to show you all something here, um, but let me just pull this up so we have uh, just some sort of visual here. Um, and then the link is in the show description. Um, whoops, I don't want that. Okay, so, all right, well, it'll just be there. All right. Um, no, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. So let's do this. Let's do it this way. Oh man, that was that that. So the, anyway, the Michael Cord thing is fascinating to me. It's fascinating. It's just you know, but but Robert Smith. Okay, so what he does? Let me pull it up this way so I could do it this way. There we go. That's better. Um, get my notes up here. So go see the part one. I don't, I'm not going to recap from part one. Uh, there's no no point in doing that. Uh, so just pick it up where they left off. Um, Robert Smith does something very interesting here in, in continuing their conversation, his conversation with Earn Your Leisure, uh, that where he talks about uh, capital uh, as helping to reach, helping the reach of labor. So, and he uses the example of Earn Your Leisure and the fellas who hosted this podcast saying that you put in your, your labor to, to develop this platform. Now you need capital to help expand your reach. And then one of the brothers says the often repeated phrase, work smarter, not harder. As if to simplify what Robert Smith is saying, to say, um, which I think is a very confusing statement. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, because I'm moving the wrong one here, which I think is a very confusing statement. Uh, 
in given the context of uh, a very uninformed and uninforming conversation. Because again, part of my, my argument here, I just wanted to get a shot of them all three on there. But um, if you, if you, um, if you watch this whole thing and have no prior understanding of the economy, it's very unhelpful. That's that's sort of what again what I'm saying here. They use a lot of fancy language. They 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 you know have a lot of style and flair a little bit. Uh, so so some some nice clothes and whatnot. But but there's nothing in here that really explains. So when he's talking about so so when one of the brothers says work smarter not harder in response to Smith talking about capital the relationship of capital being the expansion of the reach of labor. Imagine that. Imagine the non-analysis and the unhelpful, the disingenuousness of that. The, 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 the description of capital is something that is helpful in expanding labor. Not the product of exploited labor, not the reinvested re-exploitation, re-exploitation of labor, not capital in the sense of its ever need to expand and move and conquer for itself to replicate as uh, wealth for, for its owner. I mean, none of that. So then it's, it's left for the brothers to say work smarter, not harder, as if to say having access to capital is somehow smart or that you've somehow worked harder by demonstrating your value to capital investment. When in what really it should, what really needs to be understood in this this discussion is that Smith is acknowledging that investment capital dominates the economy and runs maybe the world even at this point, and that only if you've demonstrated value to that to them do you get the capital investment that allows your labor and the, pr the, the, the the product of your labor to be expanded in its reach, to be magnified. So so again, it's the, it's, it brings it right back to the co colonial formation of if you prove yourself worthy to the colonial function, the neo-colonial form will attach itself to you. But this is what he calls the dynamics that help understand capital. Robert Smith called it, and then even better, he referred to capital as an equilibrium system. A system of equilibrium. Now, again, understood the way I think I or we would understand it. Yes, it is a system of equilibrium. It, 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 it recalibrates the colonial order and allows for those who rule to continue to rule. They determine in what they will invest and then they become the beneficiaries of that investment. Because again, as I said in part one, as he acknowledged, Robert Smith is, reminds you that at the point, the difference between venture capital and what he does with private equity is that when he comes in with that equity, he's buying you up. You're getting your big payday, but he and his people are taking over. He goes in to talk about in this part two, well, for me, what was part two, more about how, you know, we let you stay on with the company and we, we keep the, the people we buy out involved that we have a, a, a track record of that, but, but no, they buy out your company. That's the equilibrium, but he, but it's left here as if there's, as if there's this friendly ecosystem of capital and labor. It's, it's wild. Then they go on to do what be, has, what I'm, what I think increasingly should become my focus is, is this point of, the woke imperium. We're going to present you with a problem of inequality and then provide you with ourselves as the solution. And in, 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 in so doing, we get to sound like we're pro-black and radical and progressive and threatening and, 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 and upsetting the system. So he says that only, he says that 1.4% of investment funds only 1.4% of all investment funds are, are owned by the world's majority. That is 98.96% of investment is white male, of investment funds, private equity, venture capital is white males. 
and and one and then they also say that only 1.4 of all assets that are invested go to black people or to all so-called minorities including white women and maybe that's why so many of the people as i showed you last time that work with his vista partners are white women um as is his partner apparently too but you know i'll leave that for kamal i'll leave that part for kamal so the re the re the somehow and there's no real solution i'm always being said to be the one without a solution they don't really offer a solution to that other than to say we got to get more of that and you have to encourage people to give up more of that and i'll ask again and go back and look at part one as we reviewed or review his company yourself vista equity not many of the people he works with are black. None that we saw are black and none that I would, I would suggest are identifiable in terms of the companies they invest in are black either. So what is the fact that his Vista group is technically black owned, though it seems to employ no other black people besides himself. How is that investment helping black people? That question is never posed to him in this interview and there's no answer given by looking through his website. So uh, again, there may be there are other levels, obviously, to 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 research that I have not done. So if anybody has those and can disprove any of what I'm saying, I'm happy to to hear it. Um, by the way, again, in response to the first one, I've, I get a, a number of name calls publicly and privately about being a pseudo scholar, this and that and whatever. That's fine. I, I just will again note to all of you that none of you have have responded with anything other than name calling. So I don't get links, I don't get data, I don't get specific points that I've made that you can disprove. I just get name called, which is cool. It just doesn't help your audience though. If you want to disprove my argument without data, you're doing so to a disservice to your own community despite saying that I am performing that. But what if, what is, anyway, so I just, just a quick detour there, or, uh, you know. But but that's my point, what value, what what evidence is there that Robert Smith's presence as the richest black man is helping black people? Because collectively, as we talk about all the time here, as I'm reviewing for the second edition, the black economic condition in, in terms of income and wealth is headed to zero. Wealth wise and income, the disparities are not closing with any meaningful. And as even McKinsey had to say, black people don't have any money, but they are an untapped resource. <laughs> Um, so then as, as Robert Smith is again, promoting himself as this black superhero, he starts to, and, and, and talk about this disparity, this, we only get 1% of, of investment. We're only 1% of the ownership of investment capital. And, and, uh, uh, meanwhile, if you go to, to unions, you, you, and he, he talks about unionized workers and the workforce in general, he's, and he's, he's getting them to acknowledge that it's almost all black people. That's where black people are. They're in the unions, overrepresented in unions, overrepresented in the, in the, in the working class labor force, but they don't get funds for investment. He says, they don't get that investment capital. Duh. That's what I'm saying. That's what we've been arguing. That's what the data I re refer to suggests as as a real reason why there's so much inequality and they don't say it this way but it's sort of left in the in the ether of the discussion that that what what that this would somehow be corrected by increased financial literacy among black people because as i made in my note here this is not an issue of of, of of financial illiteracy this is part of the the apparatus that needs to recreate the inequality so that it can justify having itself as 1% with everything and actually less than 1% that have everything. So part of, whoa, knocking my mic over. Part of what he ends up, Robert Smith ends up suggesting is, well, what we need to do is what I've been doing, in, which is investing philanthropically in, in STEM related fields, science, technology, energy, and math, to help prepare black people for a digitizing business world. So it's a rebranding of the old argument. We need to re, we need to, we need to uh, retrain a workforce. We need to get ourselves ready for the new economy. That's how we'll get. Remember when Hill Harper was saying, if we all buy Satoshis, 
when Bitcoin takes over, they got to come through us. This is our chance. And Robert Smith started saying that same thing. We were kept out of the, the, the land grants and the early formation of, or an accumulation of wealth and capital in this country. But now we have a chance to be in at the ground floor in this new digitizing world. Again, as if, just like with crypto and everything else, as if rich white folks who are already rich and white aren't already invested in those areas, aren't already over represented and have already accumulated all of those areas as if the digital landscape because he talks about there's no black software engineers and writers we need to do more of that how has that helped white people close class-wide gaps and they own everything but black people are going to start coding and writing Black girls code and yeah, that's gonna, yeah. Um, then he said, they asked him about, by the way, I, I'm not gonna take the time. I, I didn't, I didn't wanna, you know, spend too much time on it, but, but he, he talks about the, the, remember he, he, this, cause Smith was made the headlines a couple of years ago by, by paying off the student loan debt of, college graduate black of uh, some black college graduates who were coming out of stem related fields by the way it wasn't you couldn't have been graduating with with a with a with a communications or or a liberal arts degree it was stem related fields paying off but then they start asking him about it cuz it wasn't as easy he was like well it wasn't as easy as i thought we couldn't just pay off cuz if i give him the money as I'm learning now, it comes as a gift and you got to pay taxes on that gift. And then all of a sudden you got poor black kids who have to pay taxes on something that, you know, it starts to become a, a burden itself. So we said we created this whole other program to, to address that. Uh, and this is part of what he's promoting as, as his solution, um, which is the, the student freedom initiative. which as it says here is a nonprofit organization designed to help remove financial barriers to education for students attending minority serving institutions. In 2020, philanthropist Robert Smith supported the launch of the project with a $50 million donation to match the initial gift of 50 million by the Fund2 Foundation. In November 2021, Student Freedom Initiative added a new program, the Handling Everyday Life Program for Students helps to provide grants to eligible students to support an emergency without any uh, uh, continued persistence, which would persistence would be at moderate to without which continued persistence would be at moderate to high risk. Prudential Financial Assisted Student Freedom Initiative with one point, Prudential Financial Assisted Student Freedom Initiative with 1.8 million to specifically help support the HELPS program and committed to offering paid internships. So in other words, it's uh, a program. So as he explained in the in the piece with, with Earn Your Leisure, he, it is a program that is going to, instead of him giving people money that would then create a problem, a burden for them with having to uh, um, pay taxes on the, on, on it. And then him having to do the paperwork and pay taxes on the gift or whatever. I don't know, whatever he have to, whatever he was trying to say there. Uh, they created this, which would be a fund that lends to, to uh, student selected students who then pay it back and refurbish the fund that then is reused. So it becomes, as he says, a virtuous cycle. Primarily though, as you see, when you watch this, the goal of this is basically to argue we need to retrain our workforce so that black people are, are, are prepared to go to work in the coding. So again, there's no there's no discussion of ownership. There's no discussion of business development, even even at this level, of business development for him to invest in or anyone else to invest in. There's no certainly discussion of redistribution or political power. It's 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 let's invest in STEM related fields and teaching uh, with nonprofit support for education and, and paying off student debt. We're not going to advocate that the federal government pay off the debt. We're not going to advocate that the corporate world pay off the debt. We're not going to, of all students or, or all black students, we're not going to do that. I'm just going to show my magnanimous nature by 
being this one richest black man who gives back to a handful of black students who particularly those who go through STEM related fields. Because again, we're not wanting to teach people radical theory and analysis. We don't want them thinking out here. We want them coding. Just, just push them keys. Uh, all right. So to, to just wrap up here, uh, there's a, there's a, 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 a little bit of a discussion of HBCUs. Uh, there's not much there. Kind of the same mythology supported about what an HBCU is and it's, what it can do for black people. And he's talking about how most HBCUs don't have broadband access and they need to teach software writing. Um, he noted that he and I haven't checked this number, but he said that it which sounds inaccurate to me. Because he, he, in part of him talking about this paying off student debt, he said that 60% of black wealth goes to servicing student loans. The amount of black, the black community that goes to college that would incur that debt. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it would be large enough to, to be where 60% of that wealth went, unless it's another indication of how little wealth there is in the black community because the handful of black college graduates who have all this debt represent a bulk of the debt and the wealth rather that exists in the black community, which is itself another major problem. But he's, uh, so then he just started asking where 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 are the banks that invest in in local communities where are the corporations that redirect their groceries or percentages of their groceries to poor people in the community you know they're not doing enough of that that's that's where he was pointing to so again and then they rap and he promises to be a speaker at their next invest fest gathering uh following up from from Tyler Perry and Steve Harvey as as you know so again it was just i i did finish it up it was just you know a, a, another travesty of a discussion of economics and black people and race and uh and the the, the potential of black capitalism to to solve anything uh and um i don't know i look forward to to the 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 ramifications of this showing up in my classroom and elsewhere or in the comments <laughs> anyway all right everybody uh i think that should uh yeah if you just stop buying jordans and phones we'd be we would be rich we would be all good um no black people just aren't getting squeezed hard enough yeah Look, so we just have to be, again, we got to be about political organization and redistribution and uh, get those on the docket so that we can, uh, if, if anything is, you know, because nobody, you know, all of these discussions leave out that that even when we don't go to school, even when we don't set up a business, even when we don't take out a loan or pay off a loan, we are still creating and generating wealth through our work, our labor, our taxes, our not, well, not our taxes per se, our wealth, our, our work, our labor, our spending, all is producing enormous wealth, well over 20 trillion every year. Why aren't we redistributing that? Instead of talking about how we're going to get a billionaire to invest and teach us how to not do what he's done. Again, he's not teaching anybody to do what he did to get where he got. Because if you listen to what he says over these two parts, what I'm calling two parts, he's saying, if you do what capital wants, if you get venture capital mentors, if you get corporate support, you might do okay. That's that's not a solution for the for the collective. Uh, so, again, I don't propose to, I, I don't I don't claim to have a solution other than to say the only way to get to a solution is to get past all of this nonsense and mythology that folks like this promote. Get into rooms with political organizations off camera, off mic. That's where the solutions will come. No solution to the collective problem facing black people will ever come in this way. And I keep coming with receipt after receipt, 
The receipts had already been produced for a hundred years now by E. Franklin Frazier, by Abram Harris, by Earl O'Fari, by George Jackson, by, you know, so many. And I'm making one little contribution with the, with updating some of those receipts. And so, so telling me or anyone else that, that, that we can't just be critical. We have to have a solution is, 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 is not an answer. It's, it is, is, is a reflexive defense mechanism that doesn't help us get anywhere. Uh, these are not solutions. So I don't know exactly what to do. And if I did, I would be foolish to say it here. I'm very Daruba bin Wahad with this. Everything should be on the table in terms of what we think about what we think about what we think about about what we think of others public work. Everything should be on the table except strategy and tactics. So. All right, everybody. Thanks. Uh, like Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. I'll be back with the remix tomorrow morning, back with our final I Mix What I Like live of the calendar Gregorian calendar year on Friday with uh with 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 Geechee Yaw and Brother Diallo. And uh, who knows what other pop-ups might occur between now and then. You never know. So make sure everything is clicked and ring that bell so you don't miss anything. Peace, if you're willing to fight for it, like Fred Hampton used to say. Catch you next time. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.